Hi, and uh, thank you for coming to uh, this presentation here at the um, South Grove Senior Center. For those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, uh, 40 in Worcester, 20 right next door in Westboro, and 10 in Boston. As a result of there being so many, everybody gets to do what they like doing. I like doing uh, elder law. This is all I do. Um, the, the purpose of the presentations that I've had here over the past, and I've been doing these, I think, for about 10 years here in Southboro, um, has been to inform you of a lot of the law regarding a lot of different issues. Uh, I decided that for my two fall presentations this year, I would try to be a little broader than that and really talk to you about, if you're my friends, Frank, Frank and Mary, um, who are all of the people that you need to know and, uh, or, or at least a, a really important set, and what are the things you need to be thinking about if you're Frank and Mary and you're getting older. Now, one of, the, um, one of my uh, friends uh, told me at one of the senior centers, he said, you know, the thing about Frank and Mary is that they look too old for a lot of people that come to my seminars, and, which was an interesting point. So for today, we're gonna talk about Frank and Mary at 70, and we're gonna talk about Frank and Mary at 80. Uh, at the next presentation, and, in, and so when, when Frank and Mary are 70, this is kind of what the way I'm thinking about Frank and Mary, they're kind of just retiring and they're kind of trying to figure things out. They're still basically healthy. They're still living at home. And, and so there are some issues that they want to be talking about or thinking about that are different from the issues that they would face as they get older. Um, so we're going to talk about Frank and Mary at 70 and what they should know and who they should know. And then we're going to talk about them again at 80. And that's this today's presentation. In the next presentation, we're going to talk about Mary at 90. In that case, we're going to assume that Frank has died and that Mary's really got some problems. And we're going to talk about Mary at 90, and she's starting to have more health problems. And then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Mary toward the end of her life. Now, you remember that back when we were all growing up, and by the way, so I'm turning 70 uh, in January, so I get this, right? When we were all growing up, um, people would just drop dead, you know? People, you'd hear if somebody had a stroke, they dropped dead. Somebody had a heart attack, they dropped dead. Um, that very, very seldom happens anymore, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. But the, but the point is that for, for even for Mary, when she's looking at, at the last part of her life, it could very well be that it's gonna last for a long time, and so she really needs to think about that. So we're gonna do that in the next seminar. So first, let me introduce the folks that I have here. Um, Susan Cody. Um, for, and we've often talked about Bay Path Elder Services. Susan Cody is here from Bay Path Elder Services uh, to really talk about the programs that they provide and how those issues may be relevant if you're 70 or if you're 80. Um, my friend uh, Rebecca Wild Wesley, who is a full time geriatric care manager, also called an aging life care manager. Her partner, Sarah Burke, is uh, in the back there. Um, Whenever I talk to clients, I suggest that they talk to a geriatric care manager, 100% of the time, whether they are not well or well, just so they have a sense, so they're connected with somebody who thinks about, whose job is to think about a whole variety of issues can, can, uh, related to who, where they are in their lives, and to help them when, they're, when, there's, when there's trouble. And then my friend Doug Peck. Now, if you're from Southboro, you may have seen Doug and me on TV together. We are the co-hosts of a show here in uh, Southboro called Frank and Mary in uh, Southboro. Uh, Doug's day job, uh, we pay him very little to do be on the cable show. D Doug's day job is that, is that he, he works with an organization called Seniors Helping Seniors, and he's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. But it's just a great organization. Um, so th that's the cast of characters. So. If you're Frank and Mary and you're 70, the question, and, and we're going to pretend that this is Frank and Mary's situation. They have a very modest house. It's worth $300,000. They have savings worth $300,000. Um, Frank has an IRA worth $200,000. Um, they're living on Frank's Social Security and Mary's Social Security. They're doing okay. They're going to be okay as long as there are no major health problems. Uh, and the question is, and, and, and they're 70. So Frank's actuarial life expectancy at 70 is 14.4 years, and Mary's is 16.57 years. So if they've still made it to 70, then according to the actuarial life expectancy charts, Frank's gonna live, they're both gonna live until about 85. So the, the key to that, though, 
is to have folks, and I know this is going to be kind of the subtext of this whole series, is to have people start thinking when you get to a certain age, and by the way, that's my age. I'm very, I'm very into 70 right now, because um, it's coming in two months. So when you're at that age, it is very easy to be spending a lot of time thinking about how you are in comparison to where you were. Oh, I can't, you know, comp I wish I could do this, and you know, I, my, you know my, he my hearing isn't as good, blah, 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 blah. And that's all fine, except that was then, and today is now. So the real question is, what does the rest of your life look like? Because what you know, if you're 70, is that those 70 years are gone, and you probably have maybe about 15 years left. Now, you may have more, you know, it, you know maybe you get 20, you're not going to get a hundred, you know. So the question is, how do you start thinking about from the beginning how you think about those years so that, among other things, you can stay as healthy as long as you can uh, so that as much of that time is going to be as good as possible. And by the way, I'm one, of, one of the reasons I always ha ask the cable folks to rebroadcast these on local cable because there are so, so many times that people can't be here for these daytime meetings because, among other things, a lot of people are still working, right? So... What do you need to know about? Um, you, what, there are three folks that you really need to know about. You need to know about the Senior Center and what the Senior Center offers. You need to know what a GCM is, a who? A geriatric care manager, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, and, and then Doug's gonna talk about something directly related to that. And then you need to know the folks at the ASAP, the Aging Services Access Point, ASAP. Um, that, those are regional agencies, there, there are 26 of them, I think, in, in, statewide. Everybody covers a town. They're all run by nonprofits, and they are the funnel through which all, or just about all, federal and state assistance for older folks comes. So you just, from the time you're 70, you want to know those people so you can know what they offer. So I wanted to, the, the, so the point, first of all, the senior center. Now, there is folks here who are at the Senior Center. So I'm really talking to the camera, to the people who aren't here at the Senior Center. So the point of the Senior Center, yes, there's fun and games, there's programs, there's all that jazz, there's food, there's help with big issues. If you have a tax problem, there is a terrific shine counselor here that helps you figure out your medical issues in terms of what the best insurance plan is for you. Doug and I interviewed her on our show. What is her n name? If you, Carolyn, T just terrific terrific in terms of the stuff that she knows. So um, there are obviously educational programs. Here we are, da -dum -bum. Um, If you're 70 and you're still healthy, there are a lot of volunteer opportunities because that's the point. When you're 70 and up, we're the remaining people that actually have some spare time. Well, not me really right now, but many of us do. None of the young people do anymore, right? So it, it's, it, it's kind of like we're all in this together. We really need to be helping each other deal with this stuff. So. And by the way, the Senior Center can direct you to all these other great resources. That, that's one of their jobs, is to know all those programs. So you kind of knew that. What you didn't know is that you need to talk to a geriatric care manager also, from the beginning. And I'm gonna let Rebecca uh, explain to you why that makes a lot of sense, and why it is that I always tell people, go see a geriatric care manager, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Very good orientation to the tech <laughs> part of this presentation. Um, geriatric care managers, or we are now called aging life care managers, mostly because most of us don't want to be considered geriatric because we're, we think we're not going to grow old or we don't like the ageism around that term. So in reality, everybody's aging, and that's the goal, is to age and to age as long as possible. So people like us often work for elders or for families to be able to help them when there are difficulties around aging. And that might be in the midst of a crisis. That might be when you might consider working for someone um, who has a care management background. We like working a lot with people in advance of a crisis. And so I would imagine Frank and Mary in their 70s maybe aren't approaching any crises at all. They're really thinking about whether or not they need to be um, uh, exercising more or are they making some modifications around their health to be able to have more of a chance of being healthy for as long as possible. So we look at some of these areas that we can tend to look at and it might be Frank and Mary have no health issues. We talk about taking care of themselves and some maintenance issues, but we might be spending a little bit more time on have you got your paperwork in order? Have you, have you been talking to a lawyer? 
Have you had conversations with your family around what the next decade is going to look like? Um, so we're giving some advice and often what we're doing is maybe physically and sometimes it's virtually, we're pulling a family together at the table, so to speak. So we're having a conversation about what we hope the next 10 or 15 and if we're lucky 20 years might, might look like. We might be seeing that Frank and Mary are still very involved with providing grandchild care or they're traveling, they're taking advantage of these years where they're not working and they're also not encumbered by achy joints or difficulty traveling or not being able to do air travel. So we would encourage that and as care managers we want to spend time helping people to solve problems but also how to live life better and to be able to enjoy the quality of time that they have with an idea that they've made a plan for the future and now that plan, the planning has been done and now they get that opportunity to be able to spend time on doing the things that are important to them. Part of our job is to know what the local resources are, so we bring them back to two slides ago when we were talking about the, the senior center or the ASAPs or getting people engaged um, where there are opportunities to volunteer and be connected with others. Um, sometimes at this point in life, uh, one of my little uh, areas of expertise is about family, and it's not just the family sitting at the table and helping to plan and take a look at what the future looks like, but maybe it's that time to be able to resolve things. There are brewing issues that maybe have crept through into life and are really going to, they're making it more difficult for families to be happy together or to be able to communicate. This is a really good time when you're not in crisis to be able to iron out those kinds of misunderstandings that sometimes are part of life. So while we're not counselors, we often facilitate an opportunity for families to be able to talk together. Um, many of us are social workers who do this kind of work. It happens to be my colleague and I, Sarah, are both nurses. So we have an expertise maybe a little bit more around medications um, and less focused on counseling. So I think my slide is done. So we move on to Doug Peck. Doug. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. I no, I, I hope I got it. I don't have too many slides anyway. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm actually one of the people that gets called by a care manager to come in. Um, seniors Helping Seniors and uh, Pleasantries Adult Day Services. The Adult Day Services are for people with dementia. It's a program where people go for six to eight hours, two to five days a week. Uh, there's food there. There's uh, art therapy, music therapy, et cetera. Uh, it's a good chance for someone who has um, some early to mid-stage uh, dementia uh, to come and be with others and also to give the, the primary caregiver a break for that uh, much time as well. Seniors Helping Seniors is, a, again, a social model. We don't do any medical or personal care where we have people who are seniors themselves helping other seniors. And why? is because really, most people really do want to stay home. But there are certain things that happen when you are at home, and usually why people need help sort of fall into two categories. One, there's been an incident of some sort or a, a, a major diagnosis that really begins to impact how you've been doing your, your, your sort of activities of daily living. It can be anything from getting a uh, a new knee or a hip operation. It may be something that um, you, you know, a, a severe case of the flu or um, pneumonia that sort of puts you out for a while. And we all know as we do get older, particularly as Frank and Mary are in their mid to late 70s, that it gets harder and harder to bounce back. And what we are all about, all of us here, are not just hoping that people live longer, but they, they still try to keep as much of a quality to life as possible. But when you do have an incident at home, you tend to be less active and you start to become more socially isolated. It's a good reason to come to a, a senior center, but oftentimes people who are not feeling good, who are just starting to recover from something, just don't want to be around a lot of people. And their normal friends that they've known for years and years in their neighborhood, a lot of them also may have left. 
left the area, gone to live with their children, or moved into uh, assisted or independent living. But they generally tend to be less active in the social world. And we know uh, that it can lead to that kind of isolation can often lead to just feeling more depressed and really beginning to feel lonely. And that really impacts the quality of life that you have. And actually, loneliness adds a stress that really will affect you physically as well. So for us, there's two types of uh, help available. One are sort of the traditional caregivers, that if you are having health issues that you may have come in, they're um, CNA, certified nursing uh, assistants, personal care assistants. Um, it, these folks are generally coming in to do a task. They're going to come in and help you bathe. They're going to come in and clean your house. They're going to come in and do some, maybe some rehab for you along with the, uh, along with physical therapists or VNAs might be coming in. They're very task orientated. What we provide are people that we call sort of non-traditional caregivers. They are folks that are really more companions to you and um, what I would call sort of a friendly neighbor. Because again, a lot of the times, a lot of times, you're there and the, your people that you've been close to now have been dispersed and are, are not around anymore. And it's really nice to have somebody to talk to that is your age or close to your age who's experienced some of the same things that you have been experienced and are, are, you can sort of bounce ideas off of, talk to them about your concerns, talk to them about, gee, I just went to the doctor and he's told me this or I didn't understand this, what should I do, and give you some advice. Because the bottom line is, as we all get older, it really begins to take a village. You're not just living at, in your home in Southboro, you're living in sort of the village of Southboro. And everybody really needs to try to support one another, as Arthur said, as, as we age. It's not just one one-on-one -on -one anymore, it's really sort of a team effort, and that's the best way to get caregiving. And it's good to start early with some of these folks and to get to be, become acquainted with, keep your social network going, in other words, and you have people that you can uh, really feel comfortable in, uh, in speaking to. So that's sort of basically my piece and my takeaway. Uh, and coming up is Susan. I just thank, thank you very much, Doug. And once again, I work a lot with Doug. Susan, come step right this way. Just as, just as an intro, I've been working with Susan now for, wow, a long time, like I want to say 10 years at, right, at, the, at the ASAP. You know, she's the one, she's our, she's our affirmative action person. She's the young person here on the panel. Um, but, I, but, but, it's, but once again, the, one of the first things you want to do, if you're 70, if you're Frank and Mary, you want to just call these folks and get a sense of what they're doing because they're going to be with you. They want to be with you for the rest of, their, for the rest of your life. And, and they're not charging you. They're actually, that's, this is their day job. This is your tax, taxpayer dollars at work. So, Susan. Okay, thank okay. you. And here. All right, so if you're 70, why would you want to call Bay Path? And if you're feeling okay, why would you want to call Bay Path? I have three good reasons. The first is, you know, if you want to be connected and stay involved in your community, you can actually reach out the Bay Path because we actually have volunteer um, options. There's money management if you want to help people with their day-to-day -day finances, if you want to help with a home delivered meals program. Um, those are all out there for you. Um, and there's also opportunities uh, all throughout the communities. We have healthy living programs that are run at senior centers or community centers where you, they're typically eight-week courses about um, various different topics related to your health. You can either participate in the class or you can volunteer and lead the class yourself. So that's options there for you too. Another way you would want to call us, know us before you need us. So I'm one of the options counselors at Bay Path and I always tell people, know your options before you actually need them and be prepared for the future. So what I do is I go out and I get to meet people wherever they want to meet, in their homes, at the library, at Burger King, I've even met someone. Basically what I do is I learn about the person, understand what's important to them, 
and really help them make informed choices about how, when, and where they can receive service and supports in the community. And it's really just based on their own personal preferences and needs. And the third reason you might want to call BayPath, you might have an aging parent. Um, and BayPath does have a wonderful caregiver support program that really focuses in on the specific needs of the caregiver to give them support, because it is a 24-7 job being a caregiver. Um, and anyone at any time can always contact our information referral department. We have a wealth of resources, and we're updating those resources in the community constantly. Anything from in-home hairdressers to vets who will travel to um, how to get those service and supports. So we're even snow removal, winter's coming, so it could snow next month, you never know, it did in the past. So we're constantly updating our resources so you can always give us a call with any questions. And if we don't have the answer for you, <clears throat> we'll research it and find it out for you. There you go. So, and last, I, I just want to, I want to talk about um, what the legal issues would be that you'd want to be facing if you're Frank and Mary in, in your 70. And the, and the takeaway from this is not many, not many. You know, if you're still, if you're, if you're 70, you may have some issues. I'm just going to go through them briefly. If, if you're 70, chances are, if you're Frank and Mary, that you own all of your assets jointly with your spouse. If that's the case, if one of you dies, your spouse becomes the sole owner of the assets. If your total assets are worth less than a million dollars, there's not going to be an estate tax. There's not going to be any probate. It's really simple. A lot of folks come in uh, to do estate planning at this age, and they can. They can try to deal with those issues that they might have to face after the two of them have died. But one of the things I touch regularly tell these folks is, you don't need to do it now. You can wait until one of you has actually died, and then the surviving spouse can deal with the issues. If somebody owns a bunch of assets individually in their own names, there may very well be some reasons why they, they, they would want to be doing some estate planning to avoid probate and do some other things. But you don't have to do that when, you know, when, if you're Frank and Mary and you're, and you're 70. Asset protection. Um, oftentimes folks will talk to me about asset protection because they're very, they'll come in, they're very concerned. Oh my God, you know, it, we're, all, we're really worried. What if one of us ends up in a nursing home? Um, what's going to happen to us? And the answer is nothing's going to happen to you. If, if one of you ends up in a nursing home and the two of you are alive and you're Frank and Mary and you have Frank and Mary's assets, remember they, they're, they had a house worth about $300,000 or $300,000? Yeah. And a, and a IRA worth about 200000 and a and a bank account's worth about 200000 At that point, if Mary goes into the nursing home, at that point, all assets could simply be shifted to Frank. There's no look back period. There's this, you know, you, you get deluged as a senior with all of this stuff about how you absolutely have to give away all of your assets and wait five years in order to protect any of them for mass health purposes in order to qualify for mass health. If you're, if you're married, you can, at the last minute, shift all of your assets to your spouse, right? Um, while you, as the person trying to qualify, can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets, your spouse can own the home no matter what the value, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to a, a magic number, $126,420. You're not going to remember that, it's, and it changes every year. But the bottom line is the spouse at home can also have infinite income. So if Mary needed nursing home care and needed to qualify, she could simply shift everything to Frank at the last minute. Frank could keep the house. Frank could keep about $100,000. He'd use the rest to buy an annuity. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. And as long as he does that, the day after he buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. So you don't have to do anything special if you're Frank and Mary at this age, or you, or, and, you, and you, may not, you may not feel that you need to. The only exception I'm just gonna mention is if you own a summer cottage. If you own a cottage someplace, then you may be wanting to take the steps at this point to protect that cottage, especially if you wanna keep the cottage in the family and you wanna leave it to your kids or whatever, you may wanna give them an interest in that cottage early on and then wait five years for reasons I'll talk about a little bit later on. The main thing you're concerned about, though, if you're Frank and Mary at 70, is you just want to keep control. You want to keep control, and you want to make sure that if, if something happens to you, um, that, that you're, 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 so there's going to be somebody there to take care of your personal finances, 
and there's going to be somebody there to make medical decisions for you. The reason is, and I kind of re had referred to this a little bit earlier, while it used to be, this is from 1970, it used to be that if you were Frank or Mary and you had a stroke or a heart attack, you'd die. Remember, we were growing up, people that had a heart attack, they died. People had a stroke, they died. It, it, in, it, anecdotally, I just kind of come to realize it never happens anymore. Then I saw that statistic. In 1970, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, your chances of being dead within two weeks were 33%. They are now 3%. That's what's changed. That's what's changed. That combination of better medical care, more ambulances, more EMTs, the whole set of things. So that's not going to happen. It could be, though, that you'll have that heart attack or stroke and really be, be disabled for a while, right? And if that's the case, you need two documents. You need a power of attorney, you need a health care proxy. Both of those documents should be less than five years old. The reason for that is the person who is deciding if they're valid is not a doctor or, or, a, or excuse me, is not a lawyer or a judge. It's like the nurse at the hospital or the bank teller. And, and what you want to be able to show them if you're trying to access somebody's bank account is a relatively new power of attorney. And you want to show them, and if, and if it's in the hospital, you want to show them a relatively new health care proxy. I just strongly recommend that. And, and, and regarding the, health, the, the power of attorney, you just want to pay attention to a couple of provisions. One, you want to make sure the power of attorney allows, if this is what you want, for unlimited gifting. Typically, if you're Frank and Mary, you've named your spouse as your attorney because you totally trust your spouse to do the right thing. If, if you're, unless you have spe specified it in the power of attorney, though, your spouse does not have the ability to give things to himself or, or, or herself from you. Um, there's a general rule that unless it's specified in a power of attorney, you can't have self-dealing. You can't have the, power, the person with the power of attorney giving things to themselves. That's really important, that power, though. If Mary ends up in a nursing home and we suddenly quickly need to shift assets over to Frank, or in this case, if it was Frank's IRA and Frank ends up in the nursing home, and we need somebody with a power of attorney who can therefore contact the IRA folks and say, we want to shift all the money to me, Mary. In that case, you need the power of attorney. It has to have that gifting clause in it. Uh, also, regarding the power of attorney, you al always want to name an alternate, right? You know, you get to a certain age where it could be that if one of you is not well, neither is the other one, right? And that the other spouse really doesn't want to be dealing with running around to the bank and stuff if you're not well. They want to be going to see you at the hospital. So maybe you want to name that child. It's typically one, it's typically a designated child. It's typically a daughter, usually the designated daughter. There's an occasional nice son, but usually it's the daughters. You want to name an alternate who can handle those things for you if you need it. Um, regarding the healthcare proxy, also, you want to name an alternate. But those are really the only two documents that you have to have. Now, what about Frank and Mary if they're 80 years old? Well, if they're 80, um, their life expectancy has gone down. Now notice, it's 10 years later, but their life expectancy didn't go down 10 years, right? By virtue of being 80, Frank's life expectancy is now um, um, 8.34 years. Uh, Mary's life expectancy is like 9.74 years. The, Mary's life expectancy only went down, I, I wanna think about five years, although she lived 10, not bad, right? So, but the point is, the life expectancy has gone down, right? And you're now looking at, a, you know, having a, a, a greater likelihood of being closer to the time where you need to be paying attention to some of these issues. So say that you're Mary and you're trying to stay at home and you're trying to stay safe, but you're having some issues. Um, and suppose you're just having trouble getting around. Suppose you're having some memory issues. Well. You want to see, first of all, if, you, if there are home adaptations that you can make that can just help you stay at home. You want to talk to that geriatric care manager about whether, whether and to the person from the ASAP, from Bay, to Bay Path Elder Services, to see if there are any folks that they can that can, who can help you at home. I know nobody wants to have a stranger in their home, but sometimes, you know, you got to pick. Do you want to stay home or 
do you want, and therefore, even if it means that sometimes somebody is coming in to help you, because maybe you're not lucky enough to have the daughter that lives down the street that's going to suck it up and do all this work, right? Or do you want to move? So if you want to move, is there an assisted living community that's going to work for you? I regularly tell my clients, you know, you can live to be a ripe old age. Just don't fall down. Don't fall down. You fall down. This is a one-way ticket. <clears throat> the nice thing about the assisted com living communities, typically there are a lot less opportunities to fall down. So the question then is, who can help you figure all that stuff out? If you are Frank and Mary and you're 80 or 81 or 82, who can help you figure that out? So now I want to go back and talk to Rebecca about how she would be dealing with some of these issues for Frank and Mary at 80. Here you go. So first of all, I think you have to get your glasses on to read my font. I apologize, it's very small. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so often when you're at this age, and especially if Mary's alone, um, I think uh, Doug talked earlier about social isolation, being able to have someone to eat a meal with, being able to be with other people so that when you walk out of your door, you have someone who notices you and, and maybe comes to look for you at mealtime. That's sometimes when Frank and Mary, who have always wanted to stay at home, always wanted to live at their home until they died, perhaps Mary being alone now might need to be able to consider leaving her home. And whether or not moving to uh, maybe congregate living, maybe geriatric housing in town, maybe uh, an assisted living opportunity that might allow her to be around other people. And even if Frank is in the nursing home, it's not enough for her to go back and forth to the nursing home if she's living in isolation and perhaps even uh, not in a neighborhood. Maybe she's living out in the country. So a care manager might help with that kind of a decision. We might look at, you know, is it about safety in the home? Is it about social isolation? Is it about losing weight because you're eating meals alone? There are all kinds of things that make being alone in your own home where you thought was going to be the best place to be might not always be the best place for you. So that's something we talk about, you know, wh where's, where's the best place to now call home? Maybe even before this, and you know, maybe Frank hasn't yet gone into the, uh, a nursing home setting or needing to have assisted living that maybe has memory care related to it. Maybe now Mary's become a caregiver. And I think that's a very common thing to happen that ends up requiring a lot more vigilance, being in the home, having to manage for two people. I find, I, I, I always think it's remarkable that one person can manage all of their own affairs and the minute their memory starts to decline, it takes two or three people to manage one person's affairs. And we, we think nothing of it when we do it ourselves, but we start to deconstruct and all of a sudden someone's having to manage your meals and manage your checkbook and make sure that you're not answering the phone and talking to courtesy callers and making impulsive shopping, and perhaps providing personal care, moving back and forth, helping to go to the bathroom. This is very taxing work and it's emotionally taxing and it's very difficult on the body. So if Mary, and maybe Frank, one of them could be the caregiver for the other, it's very difficult and often ends up being a risk for the caregiver. Their health actually is at risk of declining when they take on the caregiving role. It's very difficult work and yet, for some people, very rewarding work and um, they find that the, the difficulties around it are, are rewarded with a good feeling that they're doing what they want to be doing. Another thing we have to look at sometimes at this time of life is driving retirement. That's the new word for taking away the keys. Um, driving retirement is a big deal because when someone is no longer able to drive, now they are again stuck at home. They're not able to get to medical appointments. They miss medical appointments. They may not be out be able to shop. The minute it snows, they're not able to go out and walk. And often there's a coincidence between driving retirement and mobility. So if you're not able to drive, you're probably not able to go out and walk a couple miles to get to all of the places that are an important part of your life. So your life changes and many people, when they retire from driving, they need to move because immediately their lifestyle will change unless they have someone who can drive for them. So there are declines in health and mobility. You end up having to have more assistance perhaps. Again, let's say Mary is alone and Frank's not with her. 
she's going to medical appointments for herself and maybe needs to have someone there with a second set of ears to be able to listen to what's going on, taking notes, making sure when she leaves she remembers that she has to pick up medication when she gets home and she needs to make sure it's in her planner. Um, she needs to be able to tell her story and I think all of us are very, very guilty of this. We go to the doctor's office and the doctor says, how are things? Oh, everything's fine. Everything's really fine. And this happened to me a couple of months ago. I've had an achy hip for a while go into my doctor's office, I tell her everything's fine, I walk out and I'm thinking, I didn't talk about my hip. I'm not going to see her for a year and my hip hurt. We're all guilty of this, but there might be more consequences the more things we haven't talked about at the doctor's office. And so that second set of ears, or a historian, I think of them, are able to say, gee, do you remember, Mary, that you were telling me last week that you really had a lot of heartburn and maybe you want to talk about that with the doctor today. So I think these are all things that we think about. Care managers do a lot of this work. Family does a lot of this work. A companion who might come from an ASAP or a companion from Seniors Helping Seniors also can provide some of those supportive services. So once again, if you're here or if you're watching, oftentimes you will say at this point, oh, my daughter does that. You know, that lucky designated daughter who is taking care of all of these things. She's figuring all this stuff for me, out all this stuff for me. The reason why you want to talk to a geriatric care manager is to see if you've got another set of eyes just making sure that your daughter knows what all those programs are and what all those options are. Because it is so often the case that folks, and your daughter's going to feel guilty about that because she's going to say, no, mom, I'm taking care of all this stuff. But you need to bring in that other person um, just so that you can see what all of your options are. I think it's just really, really important. Doug. This is a slide that should have been there. This is sort of uh, the, co the combination of everything. Because at 80, I'm, let me tell you two stories. I mean, because I know people don't really want to like having help into the, come into the house, like Arthur said. It tends to be you know, something really unusual to them. People don't think they, they, you know, they need help, particularly when it's more around the social aspect of things, rather than having somebody come in who is really uh, uh, you know, a specialist or, uh, in rehab or in personal care, et cetera. This, do I really need to have somebody who's more of a social companion? I, I'm going to give you just two examples from our, my experience when we work with a, a lot of clients in the area. One is uh, a woman who actually um, was a neighbor of mine in Southboro. Who, whose husband had passed, and she had moved in with her son and daughter in a nice household. With uh, They were in the sandwich generation, two boys in uh, junior high at the time and high school. Uh, and she was feeling, believe it or not, even very lonely. It was a very busy household. Both the wife and uh, her uh, son worked. They worked out of the house. They had, they had very you know, senior level jobs. They were gone all the time. And when they were home, they were involved with activities of the boys. So she felt very, very lonely there and really pretty isolated, even though it looked like a very busy place. And we ended up bringing some care, uh, two caregivers in, uh, and uh, come to find out that she, um, she was getting a little bit depressed because she was a widow and was coming up on the year anniversary of when her husband had passed. Um, the people that I had brought in just to be with her for a couple hours a day, make sure she had some companionship while she had basically around lunchtime, was able to go out and walk the neighborhood because she didn't like to walk the neighborhood alone, um, that they were also uh, widows themselves. And what she told me afterwards was, you know, she said, Doug, this has been so good for me because honestly, I've not been able to talk about becoming a widow with my family. It's just not something I, I wanted to talk to my son about or my daughter-in-law about, but I could talk to these two other women about it because they've gone through it, they've experienced it, and you know we just have had some really good conversations that I wasn't really able to, to have before. Um, so that was one aspect that was really kind of I hadn't even thought about, to tell you the truth. Um, in other cases, We've been with people that we've started off in their apartment uh, where they were living alone. 
We moved to the, with them to more of an independent living situation. And again, it was somebody who had some slight mobility issues, but because they, they had been told time and time again, if you fall, it's over with, they were also afraid to get outside. They needed the transportation, but they lived in a, in a nice place that had nice walking paths and would have liked to have gotten out. Our person came in, they walked two or three days a week, sat down, enjoyed the outside, because again, it's really about a quality of life, not just living longer. We then ended up following her to um, uh, a long-term care facility. She had gotten fairly sick and passed away. Uh, so it had been through a long transition with that person. Uh, all her relatives, including her daughter, were out of town. Uh, they came back in for uh, the funeral a few weeks later for the memorial mass anyway, and invited myself and the caretaker uh, to that service. And we were the only non-family members there. And honestly, I told him, I said, really, I, I, I didn't see her that often. I started off with her, but it was the caregiver who had spent the time with her for the most part. At that, when the daughter announced that, hey, hi, this, I want, I, want an, I want everybody to know at the end that this is Phyllis, the person who's been taking care of mom for so long. I can't tell you the outpouring from that family, how grateful they were that they could have somebody with, uh, with, with, uh, with the, our, our client for as long as she was and stayed there and was a real friend to her through all these transitions. Because one thing that we know as, as we all age is that there are crises that come up. And what we want to try and do is sort of plan as best we can how are we going to deal with these, type, these types of crises and how are we going to make our life really as, as the, keep the quality that we always have. And so again, my theme in all of this is it takes a village. There's a care manager. There's you thinking about who do I want on my care team? Who is going to take care of me? Is it going to be a son and daughter? Do I want them exclusively involved or do I want some outside help? And so those are the three choices that you have. And again, I, for me, it's knowing, you know, coming from a different perspective now, um, it's good to get, a, get some perspective to find out what is out there, what are my choices, how do I go about putting together a team. So when it comes to that, because it's really not if it comes to that, it's when it comes to that, you know, I, I've made my decisions on what I want, and I'm, I'm in control of things, and I'm not leaving these type of decisions to somebody else. So let me just fast forward a little bit. There. Um, so, so now I'm going to do an ad for, for Doug, which is first, if, what, going back, if you're Frank and Mary and you're 70, you ought to see if they can give you a job, right? Because, because one of the things they're constantly talking about is what's great about seniors helping seniors is that it's all seniors helping seniors. So everybody that they hire and they pay them to do, to do this stuff, are folks who are retired, a retired teacher, or a retired social worker, or a retired nurse, you know, folks who, who liked, you know, b talking to people and stuff and being around. This is a great way to do stuff and stay involved. That's just a short ad. And then, but then this, and then, then the, then the, the second piece is, you know, as, as Doug says, you know, as, as you get older, it isn't just a matter of, I know the kids are going to be willing to do it, but you may want to at least talk about whether there's somebody that can also help your kids with a lot of this stuff. Okay. With that, though, I want to introduce, once again, um, um, Sue Cody from Baypath to talk to you about the programs that, that a Frank or a Mary might be interested in now if they are now 80 and having some problems. Sue. And we're right down the road in Marlboro. <laughs> so now that Frank and Mary are 80, their goal is to stay at home you know, Bay Path has, um, there's a lot of services and programs that, you know, really give people the tools they need to be as independent as possible and be where they want to be, if it's in their own home or apartment or wherever it may be. So one of our bigger programs is the State Home Care Program, which provides a wide variety of services, such as companionship or help with personal care, or transportation, um, personal emergency response systems, um, help with medication, um, whatever it be, home delivered meals can be included. Um, and really what this program does is it really subsidizes the cost 
of these in-home services based on where your income falls. And there's really no income limit, which is the wonderful thing. Um, and this is a program that doesn't even look at assets. It just, you know, they look at what kind of income you might have. Um, and you get to work with a case manager, and their role is to help you figure out how to best meet your needs and what's going to make um, your life a little bit easier. Um, and a new program, which is coming out, which is pretty exciting as part of the home care program, is the CAPABLE program. Um, so what this program is, it's, help, it's designed to decrease falls and increase safe mobility right in your own home. So it's a team of three people. You get to work with an occupational therapist and a nurse, and both of those people will do home visits throughout a time period to work on your personal goals for safe mobility in your home. And then a really cool piece of this is, is you get to work with a handyman. So, and the handyman can help make any home repairs and install safety devices, but it's great you get a full day's worth of a handyman, right? To do whatever you need to do to make your home safe for you. Um, and I've already talked about information referral. That's always, you can always call the Bay Path number and, and speak to someone if you have a question about what's out there in the community and myself for options counseling if you need more hand-holding through that, your questions and concerns about what's available to you now. Um, and of course, the caregiver program. And um, everyone's been talking about caregivers. And an another point I wanted to make about caregiving is, you know, maybe a son or daughter, they are helping you with a lot of things. But having that conversation with that son or daughter about, okay, are the tasks that they're doing, are they still enjoyable? If there's any tasks that they're doing that are becoming more difficult, that's where you got to focus on and say, okay, here's where we can come in and help. So you can kind of go back to being that son and um, mother and son or daughter relationship. Um, so these are the kind of services available through the state home care program. So, so there, it, it, it's, there's a lot up there. And, the services keep adding on to it, like the capable program, but you're, you get to work with the case manager who helps coordinate all those services in your personal service plan, which is based on what you want to get out of it. There you go. So I know whenever Sue does this, the, you, you know, the immediate reaction a lot of times is, that, that, it's hard to believe they really have all those programs. That can't be right. They really do. They really do, you know? So if you're Frank and Mary, and, and, and many of these programs are not asset-based. All of the things that she was just talking about were not asset-based programs. This is not, this is not mass health funded, and so you don't have to meet mass health funding criteria in order to get them. And I think, I just to reemphasize Sue's point, the notion of, you know you've got a, you know, a designated son or a designated daughter that's helping you out, but you know, and it, and it kind of sneaks up on them, you know, over time, you know, you're getting older and they're doing more and more. And at some point, you know, they're not even being the daughter or the son anymore. They're suddenly just being the caregiver. So you might want to talk to them about what they want to share some responsibilities with somebody else. And, and that's where you really want to be talking to Baypath. This is a, Baypath is just a tremendous resource. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, issues though if you are needing to qualify for mass health or doing other stuff so once again remember this is frank and mary they got eight they got three hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollar house they got two hundred thousand in joint bank accounts frank's got a two hundred thousand ira and they've got three thousand dollars in income so the question is if you are staying at home how do you pay for that if you're staying at home and you need home care now as sue has told you there is some number of hours that they'll provide and by the way, they'll provide those hours, and there's a copay involved, depending on what your income is, but they'll provide those hours even if you've got other people coming in during other hours helping you out. So they, they really can supplement your care, right? Um, for the hours that, you, that are being provided to you, you should be aware um, that if you have a doctor, nurse, or social worker who is willing to certify, that you need to have those services because you need assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring, um, then all of those expenses for the people that you're hiring are tax deductible, which is a big deal, especially 
if you're paying for it and you're Frank and you're using Frank's IRA money to pay for it. Because you, the big concern always when you have IRA money or other tax deferred money is, gee, I pull it out and I'm going to have to pay all this tax. Well, if Frank is just pulling out the number of dollars that he needs to buy the home care that he needs for Mary in order to stay at home, then those dollars become tax deductible dollars, which means he's not going to pay any tax on that money. Because for every dollar he pulls out as income, he's going to be paying out a dollar as a tax deductible medical deduction. Um, Long-term care insurance. If at this point, now, so now I'm going to go back to Frank and Mary at 70. At this point, long-term care insurance would have been really handy for Frank and Mary. Long, the most important thing about long-term care insurance um, is really not its ability to pay for nursing home care because you can always qualify for Mass Health, and Mass Health will pay for the nursing home care. The big deal is the long-term care insurance to help you pay for the home care to keep you at home so you don't have to go to the nursing home. So if you can, you should be trying to qualify for that. Now I'm just gonna mention one program that Sue didn't call the Frail Elder Waiver. So if Mary needs a lot of care at home, and the reason why she needs a lot of care is because she either needs assistance with two of the activities of daily living or she's got a serious memory problem. Then there is a program administered through, uh, through uh, Mass Health but BayPath is the gatekeeper for this program, and it's called the Frail Elder Waiver Program. Uh, if you can demonstrate that you have those kinds of needs, and if, if it, let's say, we'll pick on Mary again and say that she needs the services, and she can demonstrate that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, um, then MassHealth will pay for it, what in the regulations is an infinite number of hours of home care, uh, what typically ends up being about 40 to 50 hours a week, but that's still not nothing. That is not nothing. Um, so I just want to highlight that program. In order for Mary to qualify, she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets and that she has less than $2,250 per month in income. Well, she, you know she meets the income criterion because remember her income is only $1,000 per month from Social Security. They don't count Frank's money. In terms of the asset qualification, as I had mentioned a little earlier in the presentation, Mary could literally, the day before she applies for this program, transfer all the assets to Frank, have Frank keep the house, keep about $100,000 in other assets, and use the rest of the money to buy an annuity. And as long as that annuity, an annuity is a contract between you and an insurance company, you give them money, they pay you a regular, a regular benefit in return. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, you saw his life expectancy earlier, right now it's about seven years, um, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. Remember, Mary can qualify no matter what Frank's income. Frank's income isn't counted. So there's a fairly straightforward way for Mary to qual or, or Frank, if one of them needs these services, to qualify for all of those services. Um, regarding the shifting that I just talked about, there is no look back period. It, you know, once again, as I had mentioned when I was talking about Frank and Mary at, at 70, folks often come to me, often, ev like every week, come to me because they're so concerned on the one hand that they've heard that the only way that they can protect any assets in order to qualify for mass health is to transfer them out of their name and wait five years that is simply false if you're married you can transfer your assets to your spouse at the last minute um and and as i had mentioned to you no matter what the assets of the healthy spouse are well, are while there's a cap on the amount he can have he can always use the rest to buy an annuity we've we've hel helped people buy million dollar annuities million dollar annuity so that somebody with a kind of a large house and a lot of money it was still qualifying for mass health um, regarding assisted living I know that for Frank and Mary when they're looking at that as an option their typical response is once again oh it's just gonna cost too much money I talked to a lady about an hour and a half ago that told me exactly that it but we went we went through the numbers and we looked at it and I reminded her um, Assume that the estimated cost of assisted living is quite a bit less than, than, than nursing home cost. Um, um, although it's high, it's high, right? Say it's about $8,000 a month. That's really a pretty high number for an assisted living 
in an assisted living community. Frank and Mary's income is $3,000 a month. And remember, if they move to assisted living, the rest of their expenses have like evaporated, right? They have no food expenses anymore. All the costs in involved in the house are all gone. So that's not a crazy number. So that, but that means that the burn rate on their savings is $5,000 per month or about $60,000 per year. Um, this slide actually has an error that Frank and Mary's assets actually add up to $700,000, not six hundred. They have their house worth three plus the, the IRA and the, and the, uh, and the cash. It's, even if they only had 600000 that means that money of theirs would last them in an assisted living community for 10 years. It lasts for a long time. That's longer, you've probably noticed, than their life expectancy, right? So you should not dismiss assisted living out of hand just because you don't think you can afford it. Um, finally, I know at, at this age, at age 80, Frank and Mary are getting nervous about dealing with dementia-related issues because they know this, they intuit what this number, which is from the Alzheimer's Association, that if you are 65, your chances of having dementia and ending up for some period of time in a nursing home are one in nine. If you're 85, they're one in three. They just keep getting greater as you get older because if you had something else, you'd already be dead. So the pool of people keeps shrinking down. So if you're 80, you probably are concerned about protecting your assets. Now I mentioned to you, if you're Frank and Mary and you're both still alive, you don't have to worry about it if you're both still alive. If, I'll just mention this though, if Frank dies and leaves everything to Mary, and remember that's the usual plan, right? Everything is held jointly. And then Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health. She has a problem then, because now she has a whole lot of assets that have to be spent down. Once they've been spent down, she can qualify even if she owns the house, but Mass Health will put a lien on the house. But the main thing to remember, there's a simple way to deal with that. All you need is a will that says, when I die, all the assets that would have gone to my spouse will instead be held in trust for the benefit of my spouse. You name one of the kids as the trustee. As long as you do that, as long as Frank does that, if he dies, all the assets he owns in his name are immediately going to go in trust for Mary's benefit. They're going to be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable. So while you're both alive as Frank and Mary, you can do something to really protect your spouse if you die. Uh, and that's it. I really want to thank you. Very, could I have a, a quick round of applause from our many guys for our wonderful, my only wonderful guests here? which I really, really, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you thought this was just a terrific presentation, but I talked too fast and you want to see it again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Also, uh, it's, I really appreciate the fact that, that Southboro Cable often plays this, these, these shows over as kind of a public service. So thank you very, very much. Any questions for any of my panelists from anybody here? Thank you very much. Bye-bye.